hearts and minds right and just have a beautiful time of worship together. Now we're going to open God's Word and hopefully have Him speak to us. We just want to uh, we just want to be in that space where we're as receptive as we can be. So um, let's just pause for a moment and, and pray together. Lord, we believe that you have an appointment with each of us this day while we're here. We may not have known that when we left our houses, but I believe very uniquely we are all here because there's something for us to learn, some way for us to be stretched, to grow, but mostly just to experience your presence in such a way that it leaves us different. And so as we move through where the final part of our time together, we ask that if that has not already happened, Lord, that it would before we go. And we ask this in the name of Christ. We pray. Amen. <laughs> so let's start like this. I want you to think for a moment about a story or an experience or a teaching of Jesus, not many, just one, that either recently or over the course of your life has really spoken to you in a way that has caused you to be inspired, encouraged, or maybe to be felt alive. I want you to get that picture, that story, that teaching, that encounter that Jesus had. Okay, I'm going to give you like 30 seconds do that. Okay, focus down on one. And as you're thinking about that particular story, experience, encounter, teaching, I want you to think about why that one is so meaningful. There's a lot of them you could choose from. But there's one I'm asking you to think about. Why, why that one? Now I want to take as your as those are settling into your minds and you're getting a grip on this. I want you just to talk with me for a minute or two about which story, which encounter, which teaching it is that so speaks to you. Okay, so just not at the same time, but in random order. The woman at the well. The woman at the well. Okay. For Christ deliberately touched the leper. Okay. For Christ touched. Well, there's so many beautiful, wondering, wonderful, inspiring stories in the Gospels of Christ, aren't there? It's wonderful. And while they inspire us, they also, when we look at them and think about them, if we, if we think about them long enough, they also stretch us to places beyond where many of us often want to go. Because the stories, while they are beautiful, they're so powerful because they are leading us to a different way of life than we know. They're very, there's nothing that you would read in the Gospels about Jesus that doesn't run counter to the way that we normally do things. Almost every time you see him encounter someone or teach something, it's like you scratch your head and say, that isn't the way I know. That isn't the way I would it. That is the way I've seen it done. And so his teachings, they, they inspire us to a new way, but they also stretch us beyond where we want to go. And sometimes when I'm reading the Gospels, even, even to this day, I ask myself, do I have what it takes to actually do this? Inside of me, do I have what it takes to actually hear this teaching and put it to work in my own life? Do I have what it takes? Because sometimes I think to myself, it's just a lot easier to admire from afar than it is to actually live this out. But sometimes I have to ask myself, am I an admirer or am I a follower? And I would imagine that you probably have to ask similar questions if you're honest with yourself. 
there are a lot of passages in the scriptures that when we look at it and think about that are challenging. You know, when Jesus talks to us about our money and our possessions and the accumulation of muchness and manyness, it, it, it challenges us if we pay attention to it at all, doesn't it? Really, honestly, he traveled a lot lighter than we do, didn't he? And we would, we would be better off if we could learn from him to perhaps travel a little lighter ourselves. Not to cling to the very things that would replace him in our lives. When he talks about issues of lust, where when we look on people, if we look at them in a certain way, it's almost as if in our own hearts we've already committed adultery. From the cross of his own death, he forgives those who put him there. It's almost like I can't say it any other way. And yet in our own hearts, we withhold forgiveness, don't we? Because you hurt me, and I hurt you, and I don't want to forget that. Because if I forgive you, then maybe you'll do it again. And again, and again. These teachings, they're, they're masterful. They stir us and invite us into a new way of life, but they also stretch us beyond where we want to go. None of his teachings more than the one that I'm going to offer you today um, is more difficult than these. I'm going to read you two passages today. The first one, if you want, you can turn to his find in Matthew chapter 5. This is from his great sermon on the mount. And these are Jesus' teachings about revenge and about loving your enemies. By the way, I, I think these are the hardest of all. All the ones that I just finished talking to you about, they're super hard. Not one of them is easy. I think this one, this set is the hardest. It's for me anyway. So, somewhere in the early part of the Great Sermon on the Mount, in verse 38, reads as follows. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are um, Fellow sinners. I think that's good, thank you. My Bible is like a race away, the whole word is like wrong. <laughs> okay. I'm kidding, I didn't know word in here. <laughs> I, you would think as much as I've read and it's one way I would remember, but I didn't. If you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat to the soldier command that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it for two miles. Give it to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You have heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what blessed are the peacemakers, for they are to be, does anybody know how I finish? For they shall be called the children of God. In other words, those who are making peace are falling right in line with the heart and desires of their Father. And they resemble God when they are about the business and they are never more unlike their father when they are stirring it up. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now this is nice when it's spoken on a hill somewhere with flowers, lilies, nice lily birds, in you know, a quiet, peaceful, pastoral environment. But what happens when someone flies ten planes into your building? and kills over 3,000 people. What do you do with that? 
<coughs> what about when your homes are destroyed by bombs and missiles? You are the collateral damage. You are innocent. You just got caught in the crossfire. But what about when you simply went out to run a race and you couldn't even leave a place of entertainment and recreation without bombs going off? Or what about when you're just trying to enjoy a Saturday night at a nightclub? You can't leave that space either. Because no place is safe, not even school. Your place of work, your home, races, places where you're enjoying and having entertainment, schools, and so too church. We do so species when we hit spaces like this. They become an awful lot more difficult, don't they? Those spaces are hard, and they tap into some place in us that causes us to respond and react in a way that is not very much like what Christ teaches us. In every single one of those slides that I showed you, I would be telling you other than the truth if I did not tell you that in the spaces where those innocent people were killed and destroyed and their lives were taken, that I did not feel a great sense of anger. And there weren't places along the way to. What are we to do as a called out, redemptive people? How is it that we're, we're supposed to respond to these things when they happen? Should our response look differently than those who aren't redeemed? than those who don't call the name of Christ? Should there be some alternative that we offer differently than others around us who don't claim to follow him? Do we just want to admire the teaching or do we want to follow the way? Because following the way will lead us into really, really hard places. By the way, in case you forgot or forgot to repeat it, the central symbol of our faith is what? cross. It is an instrument of death. But it is the very place where Christ took the instrument of death and redeemed it and offered to those who would follow his way a new way, a new way of life. So we're going to look at in just a moment, a story that comes out of Luke 22. If you were here earlier, I read it to you as we were preparing for worship. And I can't say that this particular passage is a template for how we respond to violence all the time in every way, but there are lessons that we can learn from it, and lessons that I hope you will. So, if you have a Bible, uh, please turn with me to Luke 22. And if you don't, the passage that I'm going to read is on the screen behind me. has, just as a way of background, Jesus has just finished his final meal with his disciples, his closest friends. And he has experienced already the arguments and infighting of his closest friends who are grasping for power and want positions of authority. He has called out the one who was going to betray and and leave him and sell him into the hands of his enemies. He has also spoken to the one who is going to deny that he ever knew him. This is a tough dinner. You know, when we celebrate communion, like, it carries kind of a different meaning for us because there's been redemption through it now, but like, I'm not going to do this in this space. Where the people that are very closest to you are betraying and denying and fighting and not, not the way you want your final meal to be. Why did you arrest me in the temple? 
I was there every day, but this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness ran deep. So let's, let's unpack that. What, what do you notice in that passage? Like, what stands out to you? There are four or five things that strike me in particular. What stands out to you? Say that again, Jim. That they came for him not in the temple, but in the darkness behind the woods, so they did their faith weren't in doing it. Yeah. They probably didn't want to stir a riot, so they came late at night. Let, let's go back to the very earliest part of the passage. When when they arrived, how did his friend do the treatment? That's some nerve. <laughs> Can you imagine? You, you already know that he's selling them out, and yet he has the whatever on his wife. <laughs> Come and kiss you on your cheek. You notice what Jesus says to him? What he calls him? You betrayed the Son of Man. He calls him for him. Now, I, I would call him that. That is a that is how I would feel about it in that moment. You? I would have a few other words I may have for him, but friend would not be one of them. What else do you notice in this passage? Yes. <laughs> well, so before we get to the ear, which is interesting, right? I mean, that's interesting. The disciples say, Lord, should we fight? We brought the sword. They're ready to fight. Right? They're not going to have that fight. And so one of them, in a different um, gospel, we learn that that is Peter, of course, takes out his sword and flashes off the right ear. Why the right ear? I have no idea. Maybe it's a bad name. I'm not sure. <laughs> And so Jesus picks up the ear, puts it back on the guy's head. I don't know why there was an absolute conversion at that point from all the people who came. And, he, and Jesus said what? He said, no more of this. Right? We brought the sword, should we fight? No. You shouldn't fight. No more of this. And then he says, Am I some dangerous revolution? I was not going to advance by violence. Right, says no more of this. And that's why, in a few short hours, he's going to be taken, he's going to be beaten, he's going to be dragged through the streets, and he's going to be nailed to a tree on a garbage dump outside the city. He could call down legions of angels to stop this anywhere along the way, he says, but he did not. Why? Because there's something larger at work here about the way in which he wants the kingdom of God to advance. It's a redemptive kingdom. It will not advance through violence. Dr. King once said this quote, he said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And that's a really powerful quote. I just wonder sometimes if we believe that. Because we're often so tempted to fight hate with hate. And violence is violence. We rarely meet it with peace. We rarely meet it with love. And in fact, because we don't, we will almost always lose. And everyone else around us, we don't realize the power of these weapons that we hold, peace and love. They're the most powerful weapons. But we give up on them too easily. Does it involve sacrifice? Yes, it's the central symbol of our faith is the cross. Which means that there are going to be times where we have to suffer. 
where we have to let go, where we have to release. This starts all the way at our 101, right? All that stuff inside of us that we refuse to let go of that does damage and violence to our own soul. And then we wonder why we can't find any peace. Because we have made room for things that don't belong inside of us. <coughs> There has to be some state where when we come to terms with who it is that we are and how it is that we identify ourselves, that we see ourselves as a people of peace who are called as children of God to be peacemakers in our world. Hard stuff. But I can't just look the other way or ignore or avoid or pretend that it doesn't exist there, right in the central part of the Sermon on the Mount teachings. But not only the fight violence with violence, violence will proliferate. It will continue at such a rate at which there is no end. And I like to believe that even though we think that when you and I and our country or whatever are being attacked on all sides, that there are alternatives to immediately responding in a violent way. Dr. King also said a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. There is a reason why ISIS exists. There is a reason why people are going into places and blowing them up. There's a reason. Like it or not, there are reasons why these kinds of things occur in our world. And certainly, it is because there is a very real presence of evil in our world that is at work in the lives of you and I and us around us, for sure. But there are also other things that are happening, too. There are things that, if we were to look backwards and get at the root cause of it, we might come to a place where we would diminish, by dealing with these issues, we would diminish our need to increase force. I think that there are alternatives. And the reason I think there are, are alternatives is because I'm a child of God, and I'm called to be a peacemaker, not simply a peacekeeper. And if you are, then so are you. Again, one-on-one, i got to get this right in my own heart. The way I treat my family, the way I treat my friends, the things I say to my neighbors, the way in which I interact with others, I've got to have peace happening inside of me before I can make it. But once I get to that place where the kingdom of God is ruling and reigning in me, then I can go on to more gradual level stuff where I begin to look at and think about how it is that I'm supposed to treat my enemies. Because Jesus teaches us and shows us a different way. Enough of this, he says. Enough of this. No more of this. I believe that nonviolent peacemaking has shown over time that it is a very powerful way of bringing about change in the lives of government and in the lives of human people. We've seen this in South Africa. We've seen this in India. We've seen this in Eastern Europe. We've seen this in Central America. There are places where people are land. And he said, we must drain the swamps of injustice in which the mosquitoes of violence and terror breed. It makes clear sense to me that where there is injustice of any kind, right, because those are the places where evil has a chance to proliferate and to grow. When we see injustice, we have to speak to it and deal with it so that other people can't play upon it. He also said that um, we have to vigorously address the issue of global poverty reduction to greatly hinder the terrorist's ability to recruit the wounded and angry for their evil purposes. Justice truly is the best path to peace. There are a lot of people who live in crazy, degradating poverty and hunger. And it demeans them. And somebody's offering you a different way to get out of that, 
then you're probably going to take your first chance at it. And before you know it, you're involved in stuff that's beyond what you thought. Poverty is a very real issue that maybe we should be looking at and dealing with not only in our own country, but also globally. He said we also need to mobilize the most extensive international and diplomatic pressures the world has ever seen against all known terrorists and their terrorist cells. We have to dry up the financial resources of the terrorists, coordinate international intelligence and security systems with multinational policing. International law enforcement must be swift and sure. He went on and on and on. But all that being said, I say that to you simply to say there are ways to deal with the issues of terror and violence and warfare other than immediately beating it with force. There may be at some point where that is ultimately the last resort, but as a child of God, we should be looking for vigorously and thinking about what we can do to bring peace to our world. It starts with ourselves and our families, but then it works its way out to our enemies. There is no loophole that Jesus gives us. There is no escape clause. We're either going to look at and deal with the hard teachings of Christ and seek to follow them, or we're going to pick and choose what we like and disregard the rest because it's too hard or too difficult. But I don't really see a lot of other options in the child of God. And so the thing that you and I have to do is begin with us. I can't wait until another church gets you follow that way, and you probably will. The one who's leading you was nailed to a tree. Will it cause you to have to surrender and sacrifice some things that you're holding on to now? Yes, it probably will. Just telling you that so that along the way you get to that place, then you're not surprised. We started by envisioning those inspirational teachings and experiences that Jesus gave us that cause us to want to live into a better way. I just have to tell you, as beautiful and inspirational and wonderful as they are, they are super hard. going to call forth from you everything that you have. Do you want to just admire or do you want to follow? We live in tough times. Let it call out the best in you and me and not the worst. And when it calls out the worst, let's pay attention to those deep, strong emotions and deal with them as immediately as we can so that we can surrender those and find peace in our own hearts. Amen? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes we're just so angry and all we want to do is fight back. Sometimes we're so afraid all we want to do is run and hide. Would you teach us a different way? Would you redeem our hearts through the issues we face? Not by going around them. Lead us to become more and more like your son every day. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Now every week, I say to you, now go and be people of grace and peace. I actually mean that. <laughs> go and be people of grace and peace. Your family will appreciate it. Your friends will appreciate it. Your neighbors will appreciate it. People in school with you will appreciate it. And your enemies one day will appreciate it. So go and be people of grace and peace.